All right. Good evening, Calvary Chapel Temecula. Welcome to Wednesday night service. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. We are going to have the uh, dynamic duo worship team up here, husband and wife. So we're going to be blessed, and then we're going to be back in the book of Esther again. So if you guys would go ahead and stand with me, we'll lift the service up in prayer and get to worshiping. All right, Lord, we want to just thank you for the evening and, and lift up this service to you and ask for your blessing upon it. Would you be with uh, Christian and James as they lead us in worship? And we know it'll be a blessing, Lord. Put your hand upon all of our equipment and all the things, you know, that things can sometimes go wrong with that. So we ask for your blessing upon all of that, that we would just be able to worship and enter into your presence. And then we ask for blessing upon Joe as he brings the word tonight, Lord, just all the things that you've been putting upon Pastor Joe's heart as he's been studying and leading us through the book of Esther. Um, just let it come out clearly, Lord, and minister to our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
secret of your presence I know there I am restored and when you call I won't refuse and he There is no one else for me, none but Jesus, crucified to set me free, now I live. chaos in confusion I know you're sovereign still in the moments of my weakness you give me grace to do your will and when to set me free. Now I live to bring him Lord, we do come before you in praise and adoration. We love you, Lord. You're so good to us and to provide us this time of worship in the word. Lord, we ask that you would touch us through your Holy Spirit, that we're able to glorify you tonight and leave today better than when we come in. So, Lord, we
We ask you to lead us, to guide us, to speak to us, to apply the words of your scripture to our heart and mind. Help us to live like your son, Jesus. Help us to be like him in how we think and how we process things, Lord. Help us to be healed from the inside out. Lord, sanctify us by your word, for your word is truth. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Good to be with you tonight. And boy, I love the, the James and Christian team. That was pretty cool. They can go on tour. They call themselves the JC. No better initials than that, right? Yeah, that's good. Rock the flock and jam for the lamb, you know. That'd be good. Be good stuff, man. Especially on Valentine's Day. What an appropriate time. Well, I hope you had a great Valentine's Day too. Well, we want to welcome those joining us online as well. We're glad you tuned in to our study. Uh, we're in the book of Esther. So let's turn in to Esther chapters 9 and 10 tonight. We'll be completing the book, God willing. And as we come to our two chapters tonight, the book is a culmination of a series of events that started back in chapter 1. And the conclusion and the climax of the book is chapter 9. And we see that the culmination of these events, the victory of the Jews over their enemies, is now been brought to fore. And if we were to break down the chapter of 9 and 10, we would say the first 19 verses are the Jews defending themselves. It gives us the historical details of how the victory was won over the enemies of the Jews in the Persian Empire. And then the second section of chapter 9 is verses 20 through 32, the establishment of the Feast of Purim. And then chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, one of the cho shortest chapters of the Bible, the greatness of Mordecai is put forth for us. So we have these wonderful blessings for the Jews here in the first 19 verses. You have these unlikely events. It started all with Queen Vashti being vanished from the royal court because she didn't respond to the summons of King Ahasuerus. And then there was a beauty pageant and Esther was collected into this roundup of the young women of the empire to compete for the affection of King Ahasuerus and, and she ends up winning. She ends up winning the affection of the king's heart and ultimately what happens is, is she is put in a position of authority for such a time as this and that time would be a perilous time for the Jews in the Persian Empire. She went through great pains and used great wisdom to deal with the king at the time when Haman, who brought forth this decree to annihilate the Jews empire-wide from Ethiopia to India. And Esther had to spring into action at the instigation of her cousin Mordecai to stand in the gap, to intercede for her people. And Mordecai gave her some strong words. If you don't do it, God will raise up somebody who will and he'll find deliverance from some other area. And so Esther rose to the occasion. She stood in the gap. She met with the king at the peril of her own life, even though she knew that if she perish, she perishes. You know, that's the way it goes, she felt. But back in her head, I get the feeling she knew that God was gonna do something. There was some sort of optimism that crept into her heart. And the rest is history. We see that Haman was executed for his plot. Uh, Esther pointed the finger at him as the enemy of the Jews who conspired to issue a decree that would eliminate them empire-wide. And then Mordecai thwarted an assassination plot of the king and he was promoted and, and ultimately Mordecai was, was elevated into Haman's position after his execution. Um, and Mordecai became somebody who was a power broker within the Persian Empire. And so the reason why we refresh our mind about these things is that every little detail that came about within the book was orchestrated behind the scenes by God's hand. Amen. And so though God's name isn't mentioned in the book at all, we see God working behind the scene. That's S-E-E-N, 
behind the visible scene world. He, his hand is orchestrating, he's, he's working, he's active, and that should give us great hope and comfort knowing that every little detail of your life is no mistake. That there's no randomness, there's no coincidences, there's no luck involved in the Christian life because God is alive and well and he's working to bring about the good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. So we come now to the deliverance, the great victory of the first 19 verses here in chapter nine. He says, now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered them and those who hated them opposed them. So here we have in verse one, it gives us the date, the 13th day of the month of Adar. That was the last month of the calendar. Uh, it was the 13th day, so that tells us that this happened in March 473 BC. It's some nine months after they issued the second decree from Esther and Mordecai's hand to prepare. Now D-Day has come. But instead of the D referring to destruction day as it did in World War II, this D here is a deliverance day. This is the day which God worked and overthrew the enemies of the Jews. Now, these enemies were out for blood. We know that because of the Hebrew word used for hoped. Okay, they hoped, the Jews had hoped, the enemies of the Jews had sabar. It's used 16 times in the Old Testament. Six times it was used. And each time it means waiting with great anticipation or expectation. It means they were salivating and chomping at the bit to attack the Jews. And with this fervor and intensity, God turned the tables. That great and important phrase here, the opposite occurred. And that's the turning of the tables. This is the great theme of chapter 9. It's the detailed historical chronicle of how God turned the tables on the enemies of the Jews. And what a great thing to read about because the book began with a problem, with peril for the Jews, and that led to fasting. The book's going to end with a great victory that leads to feasting. And that tells you how much God can turn something that is horrible and humanly impossible to turn and really reverse the situation, even for a great victory of his people. And that's indeed what he's going to do here. I mean, you don't have to look too far in the past to see this has happened throughout history for the Jews. I mean, you can look at the various modern uh, Israeli wars with their Arab neighbors of how against all odds when multiple countries attacked that only a few tanks and, and a few weapons repelled this invading army. God had to be working behind the scenes, especially as you go through and you see the uh, various testimonies and the stories from the military and some of the soldiers that were involved in that, you find that God is working. He is moving. He has a plan for his people. And the fact that they survived this means that God has a plan. God has a plan for them. Romans tells us that God is not finished with his people. Paul made that very clear. And neither should we think. If we're still breathing on this earth and we're still alive and well today, God has a purpose for your life. That means he's not finished with you. And he's going to give you victory in all kinds of plans that he has planned out. So trust him in that. Seek him that you may know why we are here on the earth. What is our purpose for being here in general and in specific? But he goes on to verse 2. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. So the Jews banded together, they armed themselves, they were ready for the fight on this deliverance day that came and the 13th day of Adar, but they had more than weapons at their disposal. Notice what they had. They had a great tool. Fear of them fell upon all of the people. In other words, God wasn't simply arming his people, he was giving them those immaterial benefits 
of God instilling the fear of the Jews inside these Gentiles, these Persians who were about to annihilate them. And that's what God does for you and me too. He has all these immaterial weapons at our disposal. And it may not be fear, and sometimes he could use fear, uh, even now and today. But ultimately, it's that wonderful blessing of prayer, the blessing of God's word, taking up the whole armor of God of Ephesians 6. And then Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, notice what he speaks to about these weapons of our warfare. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I mean, what a blessing it is. And sometimes we just kind of leave them off to the side. We don't want to pray or we're too tired to do this or that or open our word. And, and that's where that faith is built up. But he wants to do something radical through you. You see, that's maybe why he allowed or permitted the trial to come about. And that trial comes about because he wants you to get more proficient at using your weaponry. That's what all militaries do. They train, train, train. They drill, drill, drill. And ultimately, Paul even said that we are in a battle and that we have been equipped with weapons. Why not get proficient at using that? The more you pray, the better at it you become. You know, the more proficient you, you read your word and you set a timetable for yourself, you have a systematic way to going through the word and to receiving of the Lord, what he wants to speak through you through, you get more proficient and effective at it, just like somebody playing an instrument. They just don't get born into this world knowing how to play an instrument. Some have easier times than others. But what is called for is exercise of those gifts and exercise of those talents to, to work them through. And, you know, I, I thought about this passage when I was preparing and I asked, is there anything in my life that I've done to cause the fear and the reverence of the Lord in somebody else? You know, have you done anything that would communicate the fear of the Lord to the rest of the people around you, to your family, to your coworkers, to anybody you have contact with? I mean, is there something about your life that causes people to revere and to honor God? You know, it's a fair question to ask because if there's nothing that we're doing to cause people to think about the Lord and the high status of him, then maybe we ought to double check how we're living our Christian life? Are we hiding those wonderful, gracious, and merciful, and, and loving things that should be coming out of our life? Do we not want them to let them out for the fear of being stereotyped as weak? You know, uh, some people do do that. You know, other people overcompensate. They don't want people to think that they're meek. Remember, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control, okay? But maybe people want to overcompensate to show a lot of bravado. That doesn't reflect uh, the Lord either. And so what a beautiful reminder for us to remember you convey a message to people that we all have some sort of something that we're giving off, a message, a commitment, a discipline, a value and priority systems. We're giving off something and it should have a positive effect for the Lord on their lives. And, you know, it's, it's very important to, to consider that because people may not open the Bible, but they'll read your life. And then he goes on and it says, and all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's worth helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. So it wasn't just God unilaterally establishing this fear in the hearts of people. It was actually him using Mordecai's position to strip the would-be enemies of the Jews from government support. Because notice in verse four, for Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai became increasingly prominent. So instead of Haman's first decree, that allowed the elimination of the Jews throughout the empire, you had government support for Haman's decree. 
And what's happening now, since Mordecai has been elevated to the prime minister of the Persian Empire, that that government support has basically reversed, because notice what it says in verse 3, that they were helping the Jews. And what were people thinking? Well, if the government's going to be helping the Jews, and Mordecai's a Jew, and everybody knew that by now, then the impetus to follow the first decree under Haman's orders would have been less uh, appeasing or less uh, desirable to follow. So the enemies lacked the government support. That's probably what caused much of the fear installed in their hearts. And then in verse four, you know, the reason uh, for their fear was Mordecai. Everybody knew of his stature by this time. He was a Jew second in, Gehan in command behind King Ahasuerus. And this tells us that God can do anything with any of us in any situation or circumstances that he's placed us. He can place you in a hostile situation and still allow you to rise to prominence. But don't think that that rise to prominence doesn't have a purpose behind it. You see, God always has purposes. He always has a reason for something. And it's up to us to discover that reason. And that usually comes through reading the word, prayer, and listening to the voice of God in his word. That's the vehicle and the venue. The method through which he communicates to us is his, his word. So what an amazing thing. Mordecai is being used now by God to uh, make people think twice about coming against the Jews and in verse 5, thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword. So there was military conflict with slaughter and destruction and did what they pleased with those who hated them. So it was a complete victory. They did what they pleased. Uh, there, was no, uh, there was opposition, but there was no um, jeopardy of the Jews losing this battle across the empire. It was a slaughter and destruction. And remember, this was done in self-defense. This was not some uh, offensive production that the Jews conjured up and they were just going to take the wealth of the people of, of the people who came against them. This was something that was done to defend their livelihoods, their family, their children, their wives, and their whole estates, their, their wealth there. It's their whole life that was there that was under jeopardy. This wasn't an offensive action. It was defensive for sure. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Also, Parsadatha, Dalphon, Apatha, Paratha, Adalia, Eridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and Vegasatha. Now, say that 10 times backwards. <laughs> These Persian names can be murder, you know what I mean? No pun intended. On but um, 500 of those were killed only in the capital city of Shushan itself. This was because of the first decree that still prompted people to come against the Jews, to wipe them out, to take their estates and all their wealth. And ultimately, the sons of Haman here that I just named were enemies of the Jews and apparently maybe they wanted revenge for their father being impaled on the stake on the gallows at this point. But notice they were the 10 sons of Haman who had already been executed for treason. Uh, they were killed. So it was 500 plus the 10 sons of Haman and those people would have... Uh, ultimately taken revenge on the empire, maybe King Ahasuerus or even uh, Esther or Mordecai. They would have rounded up people to start a revolt um, and ultimately uh, the 10 were killed. Uh, but they did not lay hand on the plunder. So notice that's an important little detail that's mentioned here because they want you to know. The Jews, the author of the book, he wants you to know that this defense and the killing of the people was not to take their wealth. It was not to promote a uh, power grab. It wasn't to promote riches as Haman's first decree was definitely doing. And ultimately, this is important for us to remember because your motivations, your sincerity or your insincerity is something that communicates a message as well as your physical actions. And this is important to remember too because it gives us a principle to think about. 
And the principle is this. Are you willing to give up your legal rights to do what is morally right? Sometimes our legal rights come into conflict with what is morally right. And though it may be legal to get an abortion in this country, it is not morally right to get an abortion in this country or any country for that matter. And so you have this idea of, you know, how can we sometimes yield our personal rights or permissions in order to bring the greater good if God is working through them. And God can work through them. I mean, you can just think about people, especially even Christians, who have a problem with their neighbor or with even another Christian, and they appeal to a lawsuit. Now, I'm not saying that lawsuits aren't justified in some situations. All I'm saying is, is that maybe the Lord would lead you to minister to that person and to show grace and mercy to that person rather than to force your rights upon the situation. Perhaps that will get more spiritual results and less of my own personal or legal results. I mean, even in the marriage relationship, we can come together and most of the time when we're arguing, it's an infringement of my rights. You should have respected me. You should have said it this way. You should have lowered your voice. I feel offended, you know, and all that. Well, how about maybe one of these times, don't insist on your rights and insist on doing what Jesus would do in that situation. And that doesn't mean you're a doormat. That simply means that be open to what the Lord might want to do because some people sometimes need a strong word, don't they? <laughs> sometimes a rebuke is there for a purpose and a reason. But there's other times where God would have you do something different. And I think this is important because he mentions the fact that the plunder was not taken by the Jews three times in this chapter. Three times. Do you think it's important for people to know? Even if it's mentioned one, God's voice is important if he mentions it once. A little phrase. Three times he makes the statement because it's not about the money as Haman's decree was. It wasn't about power and prestige. It was about defending themselves and doing what is right. And so ultimately we have something that comes out of this in verse 11. It says, on that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. So some 500 were killed ultimately. The king gets word of it. And the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's province? Now, he's, they're not going to answer this question until down in verse 15. All the rest of the, pro <clears throat> the provinces outside of the capital city ultimately were fighting as well. And that number would be 75,000 that would kill during this conf conflict. <clears throat> He says, now what is your petition, queen? Is that it shall be granted to you or what is your further request? It shall be done. Now, the high number of deaths at this point, 500 in the capital city might have shocked or, or impressed King Ahasuerus. And he's basically saying, is there any more, anything else I can do for you? And Ultimately, he may have felt a little responsible for all this bloodshed a little bit because it was his signet ring, if you remember, that stamped the approval of Haman's first decree uh, on that decree that led to this mess. He was careless in the beginning. Uh, perhaps he's thinking about that too, but Esther's answers in verse 13, and she said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. So notice that the rest of the empire would have been already finished with the fighting on the 13th. They would rest on the 14th day. But in Shushan, the capital, there was more people to be dealt with, apparently, and so Esther is asking for another day of defending themselves from people who would continue to come after them. 
And so the king is going to grant it. And he's also granting the 10 sons of Haman to be impaled on the gallows. Now, the 10 sons have already been killed in battle. What they're talking about here is simply hanging their bodies and impaling their bodies on the gallows as a warning. And that's what ancient cultures did. They usually made an example out of people, especially treasonous people like Haman uh, and his 10 sons, ultimately, who followed his first decree. They would be impaled on the gallows. Now, it's interesting, the Hebrew language uses the definite article here for the gallows. It's not a gallow. They didn't build a separate set. It is actually the same set that Haman was impaled on, ultimately, for his execution. So you had Haman and his 10 sons, 11 people, uh, hanging on these gallows as a warning to anybody who would try to commit the same crime as Haman ultimately did or come against uh, the Jews within the Persian Empire. So it was a message they certainly wanted to send. And they did that. They, they hung uh, the 10 sons' bodies on these gallows ultimately. And you, know, and you might think, is Esther going too far in asking for this? Is she getting cruel at this point? But I, the way I read this, I would say no, because it was a message to others that this um, shouldn't be done again. It was a strong message because there might be people in the kingdom trying to figure out a plot to either assassinate the king or, or try this thing in a different way or a more clever way, ultimately, because there was a lot of people who died across the empire. And I think she wants to send a clear message. The king apparently agreed with her. And ultimately, it's described here in the book. But then after that, the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan. So in addition to the 500, there's 300. So there's 800 plus the 10 sons uh, of Haman. So that's 810 people in the capital city alone uh, that were slain due to their attacking of the Jews. But notice again, for the second time this is mentioned, they did not lay a hand on the plunder. Very important. Do you remember Abraham when he came back from the slaughter of the kings when they kidnapped his, his nephew Lot? Do you remember when he brought Lot back and, and ultimately the king Bera of Sodom, he said, oh, let me you know, bestow riches upon you. What did Abraham say back to him? He said, no thanks. Um, I don't need anything from you for people will think that the king of Sodom made me rich instead of all these blessings falling from the Lord upon me uh, for walking in faith, so to speak. He didn't want to confuse the issue. And I think that's, again, what's going on here. Not only that their motivations were sincere, but also that they didn't want to send the message that the Jews were greedy or that they did this for some other reason. And so... He moves on and says the remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies. But again, for the third and final time, they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So you have Shushan uh, being complete ultimately on the 14th day, a second day of fighting. Uh, 300 additional people were done. And then the rest of the provinces outside the capital city, uh, there was 75,000. And you put ultimately the, the Shushan's deaths and Haman's son deaths is close to 76,000 uh, people in all. And notice verse 17. Now he says, this was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. So notice this, this is referring back to the 75,000 people killed around the empire wide outside the capital city and inside the capital. So there's about 75,000 outside the capital that were killed and they have a separate tally for what is inside the capital. That was the first day of fighting. The 13th of Adar was the decree of Haman's is when the attack could begin. And that's when the 75,000 were slain. And on the 14th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting 
and gladness. Now, it says that they rested and feasted on the 14th day of Adar, but remember, unlike the Shushan capital, they had an extended day, so they were fighting into the 15th, uh, ultimately. They were fighting the 13th and the 14th, and then the others outside the capital, excuse me, they were fighting only on the 13th. So outside the capital, that was the day they slaughtered 75,000 on the 13th of Adar. Inside the capital, it was the 13th and the 14th that they slaughtered, um, uh, defended themselves in, in the killing of that amount of people that I just described, about 810 in all. And so there were two days in which they were starting to feast. One was feasting on the 14th outside the capital, and inside the capital they were feasting on the 15th. And that comes into play too because there's going to be two days in which the Feast of Purim will land on. It'll be the 14th and the 15th, two days because of that distinction between when they rested from their fighting and when they started feasting. And they're going to draw up letters and distribute them throughout the empire to, to communicate that fact. Um, notice in verse 18, but the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th and on the 15th of the month they rested. So you see the difference between those outside the capital and those inside the capital uh, who rested on the 15th day. So it was a bit difference. And made it a day of feasting and gladness. Oh man, this is great verbiage here because basically it's describing that their sorrow was turned into joy. And it took three days in all, counting the capital's extra day of fighting, to bring that. There was the 13th of fighting, then there was the 14th, and then the 15th, there was feasting and joy and gladness throughout the Jewish people within the empire. When's the last time you looked at what happened after three days? You know, you had Jesus rising from the dead. He was uh, put to death on the cross on Friday evening. And then he was in the tomb on Saturday and rose again on Sunday. And their sorrow was turned to joy. Their tears were wiped away when they knew that their Lord lived again. So throughout the book, we've seen irony. We've seen God's providential hands. We've seen types and shadows of of Christ in all of this, uh, the power of intercessory prayer and, and what can result from it. And it's no different, even as the book is wrapping up its details here in chapters nine and 10. And then in verse 19, it says, therefore the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns, so it's telling you it's people outside the capital city of Shushan, it, they're not walled, the capital was walled, people outside were in unwalled towns and villages celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. I mean, just think about the relief that was taken off their shoulders, taken off this, this pressure of being killed on this one day during the year on the 13th day of Adar, and they were so relieved. They just threw a party and a holiday and so forth, and it was just a joyous occasion even today in Israel. They remember this day with all kinds of feasting and holidays and partying and, and so forth. But then as we get to verse 20 through 32, now you see the author gives us a historical basis for the establishment of the Feast of Purim. And it says in verse 20, And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews. What are the things he's writing? He's writing about the fighting, uh, about the celebration, about the holiday, the feasting, and he wants everybody to know uh, about it. He wants to commemorate it. He says, near and far, that's in all aspects of the 127 provinces of the empire, who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. Again, they used two days because it was two days in which they stopped fighting and rested. As the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday, 
and they should make them the days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. So this tells us that Purim was not established in the law of Moses. Mosaic law did not mandate this. This was established by Mordecai, and then Esther ratified it. She confirmed it, uh, and it's still a holiday even today. You can see verses 29 through 32 where, where Esther even ratifies what Mordecai sends out as the prime minister. And then in verse 23, so the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun. Who's they? That's Mordecai and Esther. And Mordecai had written to them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had cast pure, that is, the lot, to consume them and destroy them. So for the Jews, the lot became a symbol of God's providential hand of deliverance on the people. And they used that Babylonian term, pure, and then Purim is multiple, it's plural, so to speak. So you have two days of feasting in Purim. Uh, it's a feast on two distinct days, and so the Purim was a more fitting term using the root of that word, lot, that God delivered them under unusual circumstances. It was his providence and sovereignty at work. But then in verse 25, it says, but when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged ultimately on the gallows. So indeed, those gallows uh, would be um, used again for his 10 sons. Again, those were, uh, he, the king gave them permission. He authorized that to happen at uh, Esther's request. But then in verse 26, so they called these days Purim, after the name Pure. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail, they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to to the prescribed time. That these days, remember there's two days, the 14th and the 15th of Adar, should be remembered and kept through every generation, every family, every province, and every city. That these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. So the author describes the historical origin of the Feast of Purim and Israel to remember God's deliverance in the Persian Empire in the 5th century BC. And it really celebrates the grace of God's protection on his people. Anywhere the Jews were, they would remember how God delivered them, no matter if they were any place in the world, how God used those two days to deliver them from the hands of a satanic genocide, from Haman's decree. Um, and even today, they'll, they'll go into a synagogue, they'll read the book of Esther, and it'll be kind of a subdued reading. It will be, you know, reading through the chapters and so forth. And then they come back the next day, okay, in the month of Adar, and then that's a boisterous, festive reading. They'll read it again, and every time Esther's name is mentioned, it's like, yeah, they cheer and, and everything. Or Mordecai, yeah, everybody celebrates. You know, they start pumping fists and all this kind of stuff. Haman's name's mentioned, boo, you know, they drowned it out with gazoos and all that stuff. He's worthy of your boo, remember? Um, so he, uh, it's just a festive holiday, not a religious holiday, but a festive, like family holiday to remember God's deliverance. And you can see that they dress up in costumes if you go there and they have all these treats and cookies and, and candies. And in fact, I think they make a special um, cookie uh, it's made out of like dates and, and uh, chocolate and so forth. It's pretty good. It's called Haman's ears. Um, people start munching on Haman's ears. So um, if you ever go there during the Feast of Purim, you're going to have to try those, uh, try those cookies. Uh, but that is kind of like a Halloween festive uh, time for the Jewish people. But again, it, it reminds us it's a sad day in our lives and in our country 
when we don't realize the sacrifices of previous generations to secure the freedoms and the privileges that we have. I mean, there could be a struggle in one generation <clears throat> and then the next generation sometimes just quickly forgets. But this wouldn't be the case with the Jews. They will formalize and institutionalize this feast or holiday and they will never forget God's hand. And that's what we should do too. I mean, even as Christians, you're, you're more than welcome to celebrate the Feast of Purim and to come alongside your Jewish friends and in celebration of that, I mean, and celebrate God's hand of favor in your life. Celebrate what he's done for you, you know, to remember his providential care for you, to remember how he delivered you from insurmountable circumstances and so forth. Um, and remember, as we, if we celebrate that, and though it's not a Christian holiday, if we celebrate it with our friends, you know what? It's, it's a time to remember that salvation could not be possible without the Jews being alive, <laughs> okay? Think about this. Our Savior was a Jew. He was killed on a Jewish Passover. Um, the church was filled with the Spirit on the Jewish day of Pentecost. Jesus was resurrected from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits on that Sunday morning. You know, the first Christian converts were Jewish, the promises and the covenants were to the Jews and we have been grafted in. Um, the first missionaries were, were Jewish. Without the Jews, we are lost hopelessly. They were the ones who gave us the scriptures through the prophets and the apostles. Uh, they were the ones who uh, modeled for us the prayer that Jesus modeled in Matthew, you know, in his Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 and so forth. So there's all these things that come from the fountainhead of the Jews. And when you celebrate, I think it's a fitting time to be so thankful for how God used this people that he called out. And yeah, they've been through a struggle, but what a blessing it is to see the reestablishment of Israel as a nation. God, again, still has a purpose and a plan for his people. And we're starting to see some of this stuff uh, shake out and so forth. I love what John says in his gospel, John 4, 22. It says, salvation is from the Jews. You know, and ultimately, if there's no Jews, there's no church. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for that. And then in verse 29, notice, now they'll formalize Purim in the records, uh, the Persian records. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. So they sent out not only the first Mordecai letter about this feast, uh, Esther is now gonna put her stamp of approval as the queen and send out a second letter. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time. And Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them. And as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning the matters of their fasting and lamenting, so the decree of Esther confirmed the matters of Purim and it was written in the book. Now, some have speculated as to why she would send out a second letter. And it's possible, notice the words, with words of peace and truth. It might have been that there was some infighting after the victory ultimately had been won. Uh, maybe there was uh, people still um, at each other's throats after that. May have been internal warfare within the Jewish people. Uh, it could be the same conflict continuing with minor skirmishes. So they put a stamp, an uh, exclamation point on this that is enough is enough, basically and reconfirm to everybody that we are in a time of peace now and that that all should cease and that we should proclaim this as a holiday ultimately. And they were preserved and written in the book in verse 32. So Esther puts her queenly approval on the letter and that brings us to chapter 10 where there's only three verses in the chapter and it basically summarizes the greatness and the prominence of Mordecai the Jew. Notice in verse one, and King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land 
and on the islands of the sea. So this is another way of saying the king taxed the people and why they throw this in at the end of the book of Esther. Some people are still trying to figure that out. But I, but I think that we can realize that as Mordecai being the prime minister, it's most likely the case that Mordecai recommended this kind of taxation so the king wouldn't have to go invade other countries to refill the coffers of the Persian Empire. Remember, it took a lot of money to rule this geographical area that spanned you know, from India to Ethiopia in Africa. And ultimately it was a, a way or a mechanism to bring peace to that region of the world ultimately. And instead of fighting other kingdoms and confiscating other people's riches and to conquer them and then take their wealth back to Persia and then to assume their lands, why not just have the people pay a small portion based on their prosperity and so forth? So he's reminding the king that the throne has, um, has the benefits of the victory, in other words, as well. And so you have this... Um, tax being imposed and it's not unusual within you know ancient cultures as well I mean we cringe at new taxes but it might have been an effort to stop the war machine and to bring things more to a civilized way under the rule of Mordecai and Esther the two Jews up in the power head of the throne and then in verse 2 now all the acts of the power of his might and, and the account of the greatness of Mordecai. So he's speaking of his might, the king Ahasuerus, and Mordecai, his prime minister, to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? So they documented these things. They filed them away uh, in the royal and government archives. Um, the, literally, this phrase advanced him means made him great. So Mordecai was promoted he's been the favor of God is falling upon him the king has recognized his wisdom and he has uh, been lifted up and that reminds us that you know promotion doesn't come from the east or the west but it comes from the Lord doesn't it yeah following his word following his scripture looking to him for all these things uh, and he will see that you are rewarded and maybe there's some people not rewarded in this life but they'll re be rewarded in the next life, right? He'll make all things right then. But notice here in verse three, as we wrap up, for Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. What a far cry from Haman's desires of riches and death and destruction to eliminate a whole ethnic people group. So notice he spoke peace and good to the people, both Jew and Gentile, second in command. And it's great to hear how a believer, how one of God's people used their prominent office and position to bring about good things within an empire. It was Jeremiah the prophet that said, work to make peace in whatever country you're in, whether you're in captivity or whether you're uh, free in your own country of Israel. But that was the admonition. And we look back and through the scriptures and we see two different examples of people who rose high in the government and they did good um, uh, for the people. They made the most of it. One was Joseph in Egypt, right? He rose to second behind Pharaoh. His famine policy instituted at the time of Canaan's famine, it saved uh, Jacob and the 12 sons uh, from starvation. And God had a purpose. Remember Genesis 50, it says, they meant it for evil, but you, God, meant it for good. And so that purpose of this tragedy for Joseph being sold into slavery, thrown into the pit, the Midianites come up and take him, sell him off, you know, to Potiphar in Egypt. He spends time in jail and then God rises him up and he saves the bloodline of the Messiah. There's always these great purposes. And then you have Daniel as another example who rose to the third highest in the Babylonian empire. You know, there was Nabonidus who was the king. He was first, his son Belshazzar who smote his knees together when he saw the handwriting on the wall. And then you had Daniel as the third 
in Daniel chapter 5 in the kingdom. He rose up. He didn't compromise. These are people without compromise that served and they did not throw God under the bus, but they reflected him. And, you know, as we, as we close the book, there's a few things I'd like to say about, about the book itself. First of all, we have to remember that as a reminder by the Lord that he is working in our lives, that he is working in every detail, and there's great purpose in every detail, and we can't overlook the hand of God. Romans 8, 28 is very important to remember. The book of Esther is an illustration of that one verse in Romans 8 about all things working together for the good who are called according to his purposes, that things are going to work out the way they should. And it should give us great comfort that God is not sleeping. He's not at rest and he doesn't know what's going on. He has his hand on the steering wheel. He's completely sovereign. He's completely at work, even if we don't see it, even if um, we don't uh, visibly see anything physical happening, God is still at work preparing things. So worrying is a waste of time. Do you know that you can never add anything to God's perfect providential care of this world and to you and I? Worrying doesn't add it. You make, feel, make you feel like you are, like you're doing something that, that's worthwhile, but it's not. It can even take away from years off your life worrying. You can't add to God's perfection, so allow him ultimately to do it. Give him time to show the way. Give him time to work out his plan in your life. It's called patience. And history tells us what happens when even tragic things come against the Jews. I mean, if you look back through history, you find that when Pharaoh ultimately tried to destroy the Jews, what came out of that was the Feast of Passover. It was a prophecy of the coming Messiah and the sacrifice that he would make. Or what about the Haman who tried to exterminate the Jews here? We find that there was another feast <laughs> that was instituted. And that was the Feast of Purim. Or even Antiochus Epiphanes, when he tried to oppress the Jews, the Maccabees revolted and took back the temple despite his oppression. And what resulted in that? The Feast of Hanukkah. What happened when Hitler tried to exterminate the Jews in their final solution? Well, the reestablishment of Israel as a nation came out of that. And so every time people turn their guns against God's people, both the Jews and even believers, Christians, that it will ultimately lead to a blessing that God can turn from impossible circumstances into something that just blesses others. Something that is a testimony of his hand, his strong hand to reverse the table, to reverse the oppression. I mean, even today, you and I are the king's representatives today to tell others about the Savior, to communicate the gospel. And we live in a similar situation as Esther and Mordecai, don't we? That there is an irreversible problem and circumstances that faces humanity, and it cannot be altered, just like the laws of the Medes and the Persians could not be altered. And we live under that law, so to speak, the law of sin and death. And it cannot be changed except for God working in with using you and I to deliver the gospel to people. That is that defense. It is the second decree of Esther. You see, giving the gospel is the only thing that can overcome and conquer sin and death. With Jesus dying on the cross for us, taking that whole debt away that we owed God that we can never pay for. Never, ever. And so, what a wonderful picture of you and I standing in intercession for others while they are under this horrible edict of condemnation. They were under death and sin with an eternal perishing, ultimately. And it was Jesus Christ who stood and made it possible that the rest in his empire, so to speak, could be delivered from that torment, from that death that awaits everybody who has sinned. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is what is the great 
great message of the book of Esther as well. Not only his province, providence, but he can use you and I to deliver the solution. He has done the fighting. He has worked the victory. We simply apply the victory to our life. And I want to share with you four, practically speaking, there's four principles that the book of Esther gives us. Okay, The first one is, be prepared to seize the right opportunity when it's presented, then seize it. You see, God will open windows and doors of opportunity to speak to your neighbor, to talk with a coworker, to you know, do a certain deed or action or show love to somebody. When God opens that door, just like for Esther, there was an open door, she chose to go through it. And she didn't worry about the consequences or her reputation. She said, if I perish, I perish. She seized the moment. God will bless you in that moment. And nobody says it's going to be easy, right? <laughs> Ask Esther. <laughs> it's not going to be easy sometimes. But when you see that open window, take it, seize it. The second thing is, remember that justice can be achieved even in light of the outward appearance of an unjust law or action. You see, things can be made right, and if they're not made right in this world, they will be made right in the next. And we do what we can in this world. But when you see an injustice, let it not aggravate you and eat at you so much so. Because when you start to allow that to eat you up on the inside, that means you're forgetting that God can work behind the scenes. You're forgetting that God can take and make justice out of something that is completely unjust. And we see a lot of, about that in our world today, in our culture. But then you have a third principle, and that is God's people should never give up when faced against impossible odds because God may be working behind the scenes to bring about a reversal of the situation. Never sell God short, in other words. Never say, you know, God isn't working or God can't do anything with this. Don't you see this is impossible? Well, that's when God likes to work because he gets the greater glory, right? God, how did you do that? How did this happen going from fasting and, and praying for your life and then going to feasting and making a decree empire-wide that we're going to celebrate this every year? And then coming up on top where two of the three top rulers of the throne are Jewish and can ensure peace and goodness throughout the empire. It's just amazing what God's people can do. So never give up. Continue the process of prayer and yielding to the spirit in the word. And then fourth and finally, political power when used wisely can exert great influence over those under it. We have seen negative and positive influence completely throughout this book. So if God chooses to raise you up to a position of influence, remember that you have great responsibility and accountability in that position and that he can use that to bless everyone, both Jew and Gentile, believer and unbeliever. You know, the whole world can be blessed through it. And so if you're a manager, if you're part of government, if you're in this position of authority in any respect, a business owner, um, remember that God has placed you there for a reason and there's a purpose for it and to use that influence in a way that glorifies God. And I think that we have understood and digested the principles of the book. God is working, do not lose heart. He can do anything even if something is humanly impossible. And we're all sitting here as testimonies of that. Who would have thought that you can come out of sin and death and be the Lord's beloved today? I mean, we all knew what we were before, what we thought about, what our desires were, how we lived our life, how we communicated, how we treated other people, the language we used, the, you know, the repulsive behavior that often led our lives, and we didn't even know it. It had to be an act of God to reverse that process into what we are today. Positionally, we're saved before the Lord. If you're a believer, if you're not, then you're still in the outside. You're outside the family of faith. You're still outside 
that wonderful blessing that God can give his people and that is a right relationship with him and then a promise to never leave you nor forsake you and to deliver you before the Father, deliver you to him saved and righteous and clean and wholesome with your sins forgiven because your debt has been paid, a debt you could never pay. Christ paid it with his own blood. And so anybody can receive the Lord at any time. Today is the day of salvation. Great verse, because it says the moment is now, today, <laughs> to receive the Lord. And that salvation is extended to everybody simply by believing by faith that Christ has paid for your sins and that he is your savior. You say no to your sin, you repent. And what does that word repent mean again? Metanoia, it's to make a U-turn, a 180, go in the opposite direction that you've been traveling as a sinner. And now you make an opposite direction, a U-turn, you turn away from your sin and you turn to Christ. And then he sets you apart for his specific purposes and uses. Man, what a great book it is to remind us of God's grace and his work in our lives. Boy, it humbles us. It should at least humble us and remind us of the grace of God, you know? And you just might just think, wow, how does this even happen? But God in his grace, that's it. Okay, let's all stand together. And as we leave tonight, consider the book. What a great book it is. Great reminder. And we'll be going into the book of Ruth next, another providential hand book. Another book named after a woman, Ruth. You know, two books, two books named after women, Ruth and Esther. Yeah. All right. If you need prayer, we're here to pray for you as well. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds as we worship you, Lord, to consider our trust in you as we are confronted with challenges in life, knowing that you are working that you are active, you're never sleeping or slumbering, Lord, but that this calls for a trust in what you do and your priorities, Lord, that you'll fulfill those plans that you have set out from before the world was ever created. Lord, help us never to forget what seems to be inactivity, Lord. Let us never forget that you are active, that you're blessing your people, and that your plan is going to be complete and it's going to come to pass. Why? Because you're alive and you're on the throne. No matter what, you have purposes and plans for each one of us, Lord. And I pray that we're able to trust you in that, to ask you about those purposes and plans. And if we don't understand what they are, that you would help us understand that you have good plans, that you have good purposes. Let us not walk by sight, but by faith. Lord, help us to do that better. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, Lord of heaven, do not deserve the grace that you have given and the promise of your
just thank you so much that your love knows no bounds. We thank you that we can call ourselves your children and call you our dad, our father. Lord, we just love you and we praise you. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Pray that you go forth and continue his work this week. God bless you guys. See you back on Sunday. speak.
Thank you.